I've been reading a fascinating book on training hawks. It's a true story of a woman who wants to learn how to train a gosh hawk, which are notoriously difficult among the kind of falconry world to train. And it's been a fascinating, fascinating read because there's all this care and this nurture that goes into, you get them when they're young, you have to develop them physically. They have to get to flying strength. And so you do these different you know, exercises with them. And, and then you take them out on a leash. I think it's called a crance, but you take them out on a leash and it's 20-yard flights and 40-yard flights. And your goal is getting to the place where you set that hawk loose mm. without any leash or encumbrances and any tie, right? You need to get that hawk, they call it their flying weight. They have to get them to the right physical condition, their flying rate. It's a mental thing for them. I just thought the parallels were extraordinary for raising young boys into, into masculinity and getting them to that place where you want to set them free to fly and mm. they can do it and handle the freedom that they've been given. Friends, welcome to Ransom Heart Podcast with John Eldridge and Morgan Snyder here in the fourth installment in our conversation about initiating boys. You're stepping into the fourth quarter here, so if you haven't had a chance to listen to the first three, I think you'll really enjoy that. One of the points that we've been trying to emphasize all along is that the process of transformation, the process of, of maturity, is something that God is actually up to in every man's life and every woman's life. He's up to it in every teenage boy's life and every teenage girl's life. He's, he's up to it in every boy and girl. So we think there's a lot of general um, wisdom and principles in the things that we're discussing as we focus very specifically on initiating boys. Because the point that we made in episode one is boys don't become men just because they get older. And they certainly don't become good men simply because they get a driver's license or the right to vote or the age to drink or whatever last rites of passage our culture may have. So it's a process that really does require love and observation and intentionality. And so we've been trying to shed some light on what that looks like. And, and we've been getting a lot of great feedback mm -hmm. on this. And, and thank you all for that. Here in this last episode, though, we recognize that there's a lot of scenarios we haven't touched on and some questions that have been coming in that we haven't touched on. So we're going to now come at this from several angles, try and sort of fill in the gaps about what, what do we do if we missed our son, or what do women have to offer into this whole process, or what about older boys and younger men, and how does that all fit in? So we thought we're going to try and kind of patch up places we may have missed and, and fill in situations that many of our listeners find themselves in. Yeah, so. yeah and John, I think— just to acknowledge, like, this raises a lot in all of us, right? I Doesn't mean, our it? conversations, when we turn the mic off of how much it's raised in our own stories of initiation, and I think one of the things we want to communicate through this episode, through some of the questions, the beautiful questions that have come in, is for every person, there is an opportunity mm. for initiation. And in any circumstances, as we're particularly talking about boys into men, there is a path. There is a path being made known to us by the Father. And so, um, how can we approach that with anticipation rather than a sort of dread or shame or disqualification? And I think one of the questions that came up that was pretty strong, that's very valid, is, well, what if there is no father figure? Mm. Like, this is a black hole in my son's mm -hmm. story or mm -hmm. just in the young boys in my world, like in my classroom as a teacher. So what, what would you say to that of there, there is no father or father figure? Yeah, we are there. That is the hour in which we live. Yeah. So many boys growing up without a father figure in the home. Maybe not in your living situation, but there are father figures out there. So we're kind of talking largely for a moment to single moms. And there's a number of pieces of hope and wisdom I'd, I'd like to say. The first off is actually most of your initiation took place outside the context of your biological father. Right. 
That's true. Most of my initiation took place outside, totally apart mm-hmm. from my biological father, mm-hmm. who, who had become an alcoholic. And I'll mention some of that later in today. But I just want to say, I want to give hope because the two men giving this podcast are actually stories where we did not have this. The very things that we are describing wasn't provided for us yes. by a phenomenal dad who was with us through all the stages of life and is still, you know, God brought it in other ways. Yes. I've been very candid about our family story and my father's alcoholism in, in other places. But as my dad was really beginning to collapse, kind of at that critical stage for me, I was in that 10, 11, 12 year old era where you really need masculine intervention. You know, the young boy is really moving into young manhood. I, that was when he really. My dad really blew up, but I had scouts Mm. and my mom kept me in scouts. And I remember I was terrified Mm. of my scout master. He was a formidable figure. He knew how to do everything for heaven's sakes. You know, he was one of those guys that carries the Leatherman tool in, in his pocket and, you know, he could fix anything, do anything. And he was a gruff sort of a figure. He wasn't warm and, and fuzzy, but I look back on it now with great affection. That, that was a piece that I needed that God provided at a time that my father was not providing it. And John, I hear you saying God provided it, but your mom, she was cooperating with something that she need, oh, yes. you needed that she couldn't provide, oh, right? Yes. So she made exactly. a choice Absolutely. to say, this is good for him. I, I'm going to facilitate this. And I'm not only going to facilitate it, I'm going to require you to go. Yeah, that's good. Right? And so, so a couple things right out of the bat for you single moms. First off, you cannot be both mom and dad. And you do not have to be. There's this unspoken pressure. We have um, friends who are dear single moms, and there's this unspoken pressure that now I have to fulfill both roles in my children's lives, both sons and daughters. And I want to say, nope, you get to be mom. Just be mom. Be a loving mom. And pray that God will bring in the pieces that your son or daughter need in their different stages of development coaches, teachers, youth pastors, pastors, priests that will provide pieces. And that's the second thing I want to say is it doesn't come from one source, yes. does it? No, not I mean, at it all. was exactly your story. Right, to look for the pieces and bless that, right? How many different men do you think added the pieces that you needed? Oh, it's very reasonable to say hundreds because it's everything from exactly. a relationship over time to the guy in the Home Depot aisle. I remember when I had Joshua was two and we're in Home Depot at the at the little workshop on Saturday mornings where you build the birdhouse. Yeah. And watching this older volunteer neighbor kind of guy just working with my son yeah. to help him build a birdhouse. And yeah. there was something of, hey, it's a 30 minute slot. I will never see this guy again, but he deposited a piece for my son. Okay. So moms, what you're not looking for is I have to find a father yes. figure for my son or daughter. And it's it's one person and they're amazing. And I've got to go find them. You, that's just too much pressure on you and on the world. What we want to say is it comes in pieces. You know, my phenomenal middle school English teacher, my formidable Boy Scout leader, my absolutely phenomenal high school teacher. It came in different pieces at different times. And I've spoken very fondly about my grandfather and the huge role that he played. But you have to understand, he lived three states away. He wasn't in our daily life. And so... You don't have to be the dad. Mm -hmm. You get to be the mom. It doesn't come in one figure. You're looking for a number of opportunities, asking God to provide what's needed. And I would say, look for those men Mm -hmm. and get them into those situations. So you hear about a good youth group leader, I'm telling you, it's worth changing churches. Mm -hmm. I hope I don't make waves saying that, but we made all of our church decisions when our kids were young around our kids. Right? What are they going to get here? Who's leading? If you hear that, or if you hear of a great coach, mm. right, on a particular team, you go try and request that coach. Yep. And you know, you're looking for the sports opportunities, the scouting opportunities. We've got a dear friend down in Texas who's developed a thing called Kids Outdoor Zone, right? TJ Greeny, mm. and and that's a phenomenal program, by the way, and very designed towards boys who don't have dads that are 
helping them mentor. And, and it's, a, it's a beautiful volunteer-type program where they take boys and girls out, but primarily it was initiated around boys who need this yes. and aren't finding it in their world. Yep. And the opposite is true as well. Of There have been times where we've pulled our son off of a sports team. It was a competitive program, but it was a coach that I don't want in authority over my son. Yeah. And so just yeah. to be on guard of the influences, they they will be shaped by the men around them for yes. good or for ill. And yeah. so being intentional about guarding them from the influences that aren't initiating them into who they truly are. Yeah. And also, it, we're not just talking about father figures who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, 70s, 80s, grandfather figures, but also there is a phenomenal role that young men play in boys' mm-hmm. lives. And oftentimes you'll get into a little league situation or something or, you know, swim lessons and the, the lifeguard is 19, right? He's barely, he's barely initiated himself, but to an eight-year-old boy, he is a god. And those can be very, very wonderful shaping situations. My cousin, was very influential to me. You know, I just looked up to him. I thought he was the greatest thing on earth. And, and he was older. He was, he, he was an older guy, and he had actually just come out of the military service. And I just thought he was everything a man should be. You can find this. You can find it in pieces here and there. And so what you want to do is you want to pray. You want to pray and, and ask God, what do you have for my son, my daughter? What, what does, you know, we're talking about masculine initiation. What does he need right now in his development at 8 or 14 or 17? And where in the story now can I help him find that father? And he'll bring it. He'll bring it. He'll show you. And remember, it doesn't always look perfect, right? There was a guy named Tim. God bless him wherever <laughs> he is. He was an absolute Yoda Volkswagen mechanic when I needed one. And I was, and now I'm in my 20s, but I still don't have a dad figure, and I don't know how to fix cars. And I found this guy, and he was phenomenal. He was extraordinary mechanic. He was an odd dude. He had strange politics. He was a quirky hermit. He lived alone. But for that hour and in that episode of my life, he was exactly what I needed. Yes. So don't look for perfect. Totally. Father, what do you have? Oh, he so often gives us not what we want, but what we need. Uh, Robert Bly and Iron John talks about that there is a a substance that actually rubs off on a man. And so, John, as you tell that story, I'm just reminded, even the proximity of a man who has some piece of masculinity restored in him. I remember Joshua was in preschool, and it was a pumpkin patch that was sponsored by the local rancher. And this cowboy was in his 80s, his late 80s. And he's over on the corner, but I remember taking Joshua over to the cowboy because I just knew a guy like that has something. And I said, sir, thank you for hosting us at the Pumpkin Patch. And we're glad to be here and we appreciate you. And he got down at Joshua's face, this old crusty cowboy. And he said, son, I need to tell you. And I said to him, I said, do you have any wisdom for my son? And he said, son, I got two things for you. Don't ever step over a log without looking and always go to bed on the same day you woke up. (laughs) And my little preschool kid looks up to him. But And and the beauty is, the point is, that man became legend for us. He became this icon of a piece to basically say, where are the pieces that God is putting together a portrait of his heart to initiate our sons? And that, that forms our eyes to see it. Yeah, so think mosaic. That's good. Think mosaic. Think a a number of beautiful small pieces that together will provide what's needed. I think one of the questions that's come back in from the first three episodes, oh no, we blew it. We missed our son. Mm. And now he's 17 or 27 or 47 and we're listening and we get it. We see it and we didn't provide it. And we can see ways that maybe it's affecting him now. What do we do? And I think what I want to say there, the first step is always the relationship. Protect the relationship. I remember it was during the teenage years, and those are difficult disciplinary years because, you know, you're moving out of timeouts and you're into, you know, young men who, who have strength and opinions. And I was going downstairs and I was fried. I was ready to lower the boom on one of my sons, and I 
But I'm praying as I'm marching down the stairs to drop the ax. And I said, Father, what do I need? Just what do I need right now in this moment? And he said, you have one goal right now, and it is to preserve the relationship. So I would say recovering the relationship, reestablishing the relationship is your primary goal in places where you feel like you've missed it or haven't offered. Uh, Maybe you've got an angry teen now, or you've got a son who's really pulled away. Now that they're older, you can have mature conversations like we're sorry, Mm. like asking forgiveness Mm. to say, gosh, we, we recognize there are some things that we really missed in your childhood. We were gone. We were busy. We had other priorities. Whatever the story may be, I'm sorry for the ugly divorce and how we, we took you through that. Asking forgiveness. John, as you say that, my honest experience of it is from walking with so many men, it quickly takes us to motive because this isn't tips and techniques, right? This isn't, okay, things are sideways with my 17-year-old. John said, I need to go say I'm sorry, Mm -hmm. right? Because you quickly look at the motive and say, well, what is the motive in approaching him? And you want Mm -hmm. things to be better so you feel better, right? And just aware, you're, you're... pointing to something really deep to to cultivate an honest remorse for ways that we all, frankly, have missed our sons takes time, takes a real consideration of looking under the hood of mm-hmm. our own story and why. Mm-hmm. Why did we find ourselves that way? So I think as you say that, something we're on holy ground and something wants me to remind our friends out there to take it slow and to only approach him when you're ready to receive some honest feedback for their own sake. Yeah, yeah, without explaining or defending. Now, I want to come back to the two basic things. The whole process is built on, I love you, and you have what it takes. Mm. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The word the Father speaks over Jesus at 30 years old, okay? 30. Mm. He still needs to hear that from his Father, okay? Those essential things, you can still offer that. So what does communicating love look like now? And what does communicating validation look like now? Now, I understand. You may have to search for it. You're going to have to find something you can validate. Uh, But you're in a fight and he's raging at you. You say, I am really impressed with your ability to control your temper right now. I mean, Mm. that may be the one thing you can find to validate. But what does he need now? Comes back to father. What does my 17-year-old, 23-year-old, you know, 40-year-old son, what does he need now? How can I help enter into the process now? And I want to give a plug for a moment. I wrote a book on the six stages of the masculine journey called Fathered by God. It was initially The Way of the Wild Heart, and that would be really worth getting your hands on, but you only have to find that in used bookstores. You can get Fathered by God from us or, or any bookstore And in there, it takes you from beloved son to the cowboy stage, which is the teenage years, and that's the increasing adventures and harder work and that sort of thing. Beloved son, cowboy, warrior, lover, king, and sage. And in that book, I talk about most men didn't get this. Mm. How do we get it now? And so it will give you some things to think about. It will give you some resources to go, okay, our son did not get this. How do we help him get it now? But speaking about we missed our son and what do we do now, I I do want to say some things about older, older young men, okay? So, you know, we talked about the years somewhere between, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14. There is this shift, gang. And if you hadn't encountered it yet, it's just going to blow your mind how clear the young boy says, I'm done being boy, I'm ready to become young man. And he's going to ask for initiation, whether you're prepared for it or not, right? Oh, yesterday, Joshua said, you know, Dad, I think next summer, I'm just thinking about what job I want. He said, because I just realized, like, just thinking about each day of when I'm going to get a workout and who I'm hanging out with. I mean, that's good, but he's like, I'm ready to work. And there's just that moment of, like, his own initiative. And so I'm just aware, I'm right in that sweet spot of how do I, right? okay, how do I respond to what he needs in this season? Exactly. Right. So then they enter into the teenage years, and then you have the late teens and the the early 20s, the high school graduation, college years, 
might be trade school, might be military, but this is the age group I want to talk about for a minute. And it brings me back to that hawk analogy, because you are building into the young man to the place where there's no more leash. I read a beautiful story. I forget where this was, but a mother was at the bridal shower of her new, soon-to-be daughter-in-law. And the gift, the daughter-in-law opens the gift, and the box is a pair of scissors and two apron strings. And that was the mother's gift to her daughter-in-law, who was marrying her son, to say, I release him. Wow. I cut the apron strings. I recognize that I need to let this hawk fly. Mm. You know, I need to, I, you are building a young man towards independence. And the more that you can build that into their teenage years, especially, you know, it's the permission to drive. It's the permission to go on the weekend camping trip. I remember when our sons came to us and said, hey, we're ready. We want to do our first road trip. And this is Colorado to California. This is a big deal. Teenage boys. Now, they were headed from one safe destination to another. We didn't just give them, you know, a credit card and in two weeks um, go have a ball. It, it was, you know, they were heading to a friend's house, but permission to take the road trips, right? You're lengthening the leash. You're lengthening and you're increasing the ability for them to make bigger mistakes, mm. right? Because you're building into them. You want that independence, so that when the day comes, you know, for them to truly to truly leave. So I'm just thinking about fixing stuff, joining in when things break. How do we fix this? What do we do with this? Most of the masculine initiation in these years does take place through trials. And so it, it's signing them up for the Habitat for Humanity weekend, where they go and they, as a volunteer, build a house for a needy family. And it's just hard work and it's a mess. And they come home smelling and covered in drywall dust. And that's good stuff. <laughs> that's great. Right? It's mostly through difficulties. Yes. You know, looking for those opportunities. Yes, sign them up for, you know, the week-long college, you know, trip, the high school or college group trip at church to, you know, Mexico. Yes, you put them in those difficult situations. And I'm thinking of um, Outward Bound mm -hmm. and programs like that, back to single moms. Right, you got a teenage son, and he's just itching to do something. Man, grab his summer and get him in one of those Knolls yep. um, National Outdoor Leadership School, Outward Bound. Many programs like those now. Oh my goodness! Yep, there's 18 inch journey. If you're looking for more of like a gap year spiritual. Um, physical experience to trail building right here in Colorado. Exactly. There's all kinds of volunteer groups that you can spend a month working, exactly. building trail. Yeah, you can go into your local REI mm -hmm. and they have signups for work weekends. And if you're if your 16, 17, 18 year old son has not yet done a work weekend, sign them up. Yeah, they need to get out there with a shovel and fix trail or dig holes or repair cars for needy families or whatever the particular projects are. But I do want to say the apron string story, as the young man begins to reach what we would call young manhood, independence, leaving for college, going off to the military, starting off on his own, mom, her hardest job in these years is letting go. It is Eve's greatest sorrow. Oh, it is so difficult to do because you are nurture, and you are mother hen, and you are mama bear, and you are protection, and, and you have had that role in his life. But as the young boy enters those teenage years, you, you do need to begin to let go. And the boy will know whether or not you're doing it. And if you don't, he will fight back. Mm -hmm. He will push away. And you don't want to force him to do that. He knows that he needs independence from the feminine world mm -hmm. to fully enter the masculine world. And so the best thing a mom can do, you know, the road trip, I thought it was a great idea. Stacy thought it was a ridiculous idea. She bit her tongue and said, yes, mm. the, the, the mom practices letting go. Yeah, John, the, the piece that comes up with that, just thinking of all the stories of men we've walked through who've lived the painful consequences of moms that haven't let go. You know, um, to be frank, there is this theme of so many moms that in the absence of 
intimacy with their husband or the absence of something they needed, they turned, even unconsciously, to the sun to provide something. And um, it can be pretty damaging. And so even in a, in a healthy environment, it needs to be let go of. But to be aware of what is it you are looking for for him to fill mm-hmm. um, because it, it can cause great harm. Yeah, yeah. So now let me speak to, this was another question that came up and it fits right in the flow here, but what does a woman yes. offer then into the process of masculine initiation? And um, so much, I oh, want to yes. say, so much, so much to offer here. Um, mom and dad are different, and masculinity and femininity are different, but mom and femininity, the women in his life offer tons. So I, I want to jump into that by asking you a question. Okay. You, you and Joshua are being super intentional. By the way, did he get the nail gun? Is that- he did. He did. <laughs> It's beautiful. <laughs> That's awesome. Can I borrow it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to borrow it myself. <laughs> um, you guys are being super intentional about this and 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 setting a vision and 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 really living into it. What do you see Sherry offering Joshua from the feminine heart in his masculine journey? Yeah, it's that's a it's it's really great to even think about my wife in that position because it's irreplaceable. It is as important as the father, if not more so. I mean, we have teaching on this, and but one of the core ideas here we talk about is that um, masculinity bestows validation and femininity bestows self-worth. And it is distinctly different. There is some message that as I watch Sherry relate to my son, who is an enigma to her, she doesn't understand him a lot of the time because he is all male. But what she communicates as best she is able is you are worthy of love and belonging because you exist. You're worthy of love, not because of what you do or haven't done um, or how you failed or succeeded, but you are worthy of love because you exist. And and John, I think what I'd say is I think about Sherry and observing, it's the opposite of withholding. It's this energy of uh, abundance, mm. abundant affection, mm. abundant uh, room to make mistakes, mm-hmm. abundance in entertaining his questions and quirkiness. And she she comes to me going, is this 14? Like, is this normal 14? Because she's not a man and she's never had a 14-year-old before. And that's one of our fabulous lines in our house. We say, Joshua, we've never done this before. We've never parented a 14-year-old. So this is all an experiment for us as well. But that she will ask him questions and also stop asking questions when it's over the top and let him be in a bad mood and huff and puff when just his hormones need to huff and puff. Yeah. And, she, and But when he's in a place to receive it, she will call attention to his masculinity, even to the point, John, where what I appreciate is she will describe his effect in his masculinity on her femininity. So she will say things like, Joshua, I, I felt really safe in that moment where you came out and grabbed your sister because there was a lot of chaos during that carpool out there. And I just noticed that you grabbed her at carpool and brought her over. I felt safe because of your strength. Yeah. These thoughts that we have all the time in our head, the discipline of speaking them yeah. into existence. And so to watch her give him permission to be a boy and permission to slowly in a bumpy way become a young man. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that femininity, uh, it brings so many things to the world. Eve is a life giver. She literally bestows life and not just through her body, but through her words, through her life, through her love, through her wisdom, through her insight, through her spirituality. Um, I think that um, women offer into the process of masculine initiation 
I think you're amazing. It, it, it is a fascinating thing to watch men around the company of women. They want to show off. Mm -hmm. They want, you know, high school, pool party. He wants to do the backflip, right? The guy wants to show off in front of the girls. Well, why is that? Because there's something about a woman saying to a man or a young man or a boy, that was amazing that just sets off fireworks inside the masculine soul. I'm a hero. I did it, yes. right? I'm the man. Yes. And so, my goodness, your validation to him, honey, you're so amazing at the way you did that. And not in a condescending way, not, not in an overly you know, syrupy way, but I felt safe with you. Yes. That was a really strong thing you said to, to your cousin yesterday, way to take a stand, or just the yes. hundreds of ways you can offer your words. I think you're amazing. I think that, Eve offers mercy and unconditional love. And you were describing that with Sherry to Joshua, just that unconditional loving and benediction on his life. You know, when, when the boy wants to try the motorcycle for the first time, he asks dad. When he crashes it, who does he run to? Mom, right? When he's got the owie, when he's got the scrape up, when his feelings are hurt, he goes to mom because mom is a source of mercy. She's meant to be mercy incarnate. Um, now, you know, having said that, I think that Eve calls men up. I mm. think that the women in a, in a developing boy's life call him up. I, I, I have this clip in my mind today from, uh, the newsreels around the Ferguson riots. And I remember a, a young mom going in and yanking her teenage son out of, he was one of the protesters and he had a ski mask on, but she knew exactly who he was, <laughs> right? And she walks over and grabs him and pulls him out of there. And mm. she is giving him a lecture mm. as they are leaving. And just that clip of, way to go, mom. Femininity calls masculinity up. I see more in you. I see greatness in you. You can do better. Right, the, and because it's couched in mercy and unconditional love, it's not a critical thing. But I think femininity calls masculinity up, don't you? Yeah, it's really good. I think of examples where Sherry will help Joshua process his world with his peers, particularly young girls. Right, where she'll just make observations, and it's the opposite of nagging. In other words, you don't want to be the drippy faucet yeah. that Proverbs talks about. But there's something to say. It's almost like speaking out the good you see and calling it forth. Bingo! Right, and saying, "Oh, I saw that in you." And you might have seen seven other things that were not that great, but that one golden thing to just name it and say, "I see who you are." Yeah. And at the same time, John. You know, one one of the things, man, you just coached me so much about years ago. You said, we will almost always treat them older than they are. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That was such a rescue because part of them is older and part of them is younger than they appear. Yes. And every child's different. But I think in this area of not only what she brings, but what she doesn't bring you can begin looking to those teenagers for something that they're not to provide for you. Yes. Frankly, if I'm withholding love. Companionship. Yeah, I'm I'm taken out, I'm frustrated, I'm angry. And Joshua is very conversational. She can be tempted to engage him, but it's actually out of her own need. And she has found herself going there, going, oh, this is not for his sake. And he's yes. younger than he appears. And so yes. permission to celebrate the boy and allow him to be a boy. Yes. Okay. Um, another thing for women to men, and we're going to have to um, bring this in for landing shortly, and I hate to do that because there's several more things I want to say, but the phrase, can you help me with this? It, it may be the single most significant phrase, apart from I love you, I adore you, that a, that a woman can offer a man at any age of his life. Can you help me with this? Because it is... You have a strength, I need it. Yes. So, honey, whatever it is, whether it's the groceries into the house, yes. the flat tire, help me change the flat tire, it's just anything other than her emotional issues. Oh, say that you, again. You do not take <laughs> your emotional issues to your adolescent son and ask him to fix it. Okay, he doesn't become your confidant. 
and this goes on to older, older young men, by the way, ladies, um, you are in a process from, from being very, very nurturing and your role changes to champion and advocate. And, and it's a letting go. It's a letting go of the closeness and the nurturing and the story time and the snuggles and the, you know, um, two, the young man needs to, he needs to have the freedom to fly. Yes. And, and you are his champion and his advocate, but you are not asking him to meet those needs. And so I was talking to a young man and, and he said, he just used the phrase, yeah, I was talking to my mom yesterday. He's 24 years old. And it sounded like it was a frequent thing. So I asked him, I said, how often do you talk to your mom? And he says, oh, she calls me every day. I'm like, whoa, that's a problem. Your boy's 24. You do not call him every day. Once a week, I mean that—that's just, and just name what's behind it, John. What your what what the everyday call is representing? It, she's still got a leash on him. The mm. apron strings are still tight. She's not giving him independence, including the independence of not knowing what he's doing. You don't know what he's doing, and you don't know what he's thinking, and you don't know how he's feeling. And I know, I know, Eve. It's the hardest thing in the world for her to do. But it is how you participate in the process of, it's one of the ways that you participate in the process. Now, I've got to say two more things before we go. Um, There is no substitute in all of this for listening prayer. As a parent, asking God, what does my child need? Mm. Where should they go to school this year? What kind of schooling situation do they need? Should they be in this sports program, this music program? You know, is this the right church for them? Is this the right church group for them? I mean, just on and on the questions go. What does my child need? You you can't replace listening prayer. There's just no parenting manual that's going to fill in the blanks for your relationship with God. You know, like me going downstairs, and I'm furious and ready to, you know, righteously, by the way, it was all very righteous, lower the disciplinary boom, and and the father steps in and says, your goal right now is to preserve relationship. Well, that was a rescue Mm. for me, right? You cannot replace that. And so I would say, parents, what's the most valuable thing you can do? You, You can ask God, what does my son need? at this stage in his life? What are we working on? What are we working on right now, Mm -hmm. Father? Right? There's lots to work on. What are we working on right now? What should he do for work next summer? Right? There's a lot of different options. He might do a summer camp. He might join a Young Life thing. You know, Father, what do Mm -hmm. you have? What's so beautiful about the listening prayer is it, it requires the drawing us into the present moment. Like you were talking about the regret, you know, of, well, what? Oh, dang, I missed it. Well, we all are baited with regret. Every one of us can look back and that spirit of regret of the past or that spirit of worry or anxiety of the future just steals from the present moment. But what I so appreciate about listening prayer, it's not nailing it, it's practicing, starting with small things, but it causes me to say, what I have is the here and now. This moment, mm-hmm. this day, mm-hmm. this circumstance, and and God, I'm trusting that you're, or, you're leading the initiation mm-hmm. of my son. And so mm-hmm. I want to come into this moment mm-hmm. and, and tap into your resources because you will provide for this, for this present situation. So I'm just urge mm-hmm. all of us, what, would the, what does it take to come back into the present moment, the here and now initiation of our kids? And ask, ask our Father, ask Jesus, Ask Holy Spirit, what, what do you have? What do, what do I need? What's, what's going on here? Would you give me the keys to my child's heart? Last thought. Um, I'm just cracking up but as I make this statement. I thought parenting was largely over. We have three adult sons now. They're, they're fabulous. They're mature adults. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know where they are. I don't know what they're thinking on any given day of the week. They are living their own lives. Um, But the amount of parenting that Stacy and I are doing now feels like more than ever because now it's young marriages and there's a lot of questions there. 
right? Now it's young careers, and there's a lot of questions there. It's, it's church communities they're trying to navigate and build fellowships and the relational setbacks and betrayals and, you know, just the nastiness of all that stuff. And there's a lot of questions there. And I, it, I'm just cracking up. Folks, once you're a parent, you're always a parent. And, and the, the beautiful thing of this is love and validation your 62-year-old son still wants that from you, 89-year-old mom. He does. I'll guarantee it. And I, you know, we had a lot of estranged years with my dad, but there was a remarkable moment. He, he did a few things towards the end of his life that were really very surprising. I think I was about 48, 49 years old, and he sent me a letter. Mm. I had never gotten a letter from At my 49. dad. 49. 49, I get a letter in the mailbox, postage stamp <laughs> on it, letter from my dad. It, it, now, you understand, this is a man who has wounded me profoundly, abandoned me to figure out life on my own. And, and, and in this letter, he is saying in his own awkward way, words like, I am proud of you. I, I hung on to that letter for a year. Okay, so you're talking about a broken relationship, estranged, you know, and yet, guys, it's, gals, it's always there. The yearning for love and validation is always there. You always have the opportunity to speak that into their life. Let me throw out one last thing. We tossed out a number of quick ideas there, 18-inch journey, Knowles, Outward Bound, Kids Outdoor Zone. Go back and listen to this if that interests you and get on their websites and look into those, look in REI and their work programs on the weekend and stuff. We threw a lot of things out very quickly, but there was some gold in that that might be worth getting on the internet and looking up some of that stuff to see what's available to you. We hope you've enjoyed this series. There's obviously so much more to go into, but it feels like four parts is enough for now. And uh, you have that wonderful relationship with the living God, so you can ask Him to fill in the gaps in your personal questions. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge, Morgan Snyder, 